Corey mentioned that I, I wrote a book called Mind, Matter, Nature, which is a Thomistic proposal for the philosophy of mind. Uh, what I'm going to actually say here is my proposal uh, for Thomist is to stop it, stop doing philosophy of mind. Uh, I think that, and this is the gist of what I'm going to press here, is, is Thomas should be aloof to the problems of philosophy of mind. Uh, and one of the benefits of that is the fight that a lot of uh, philosophers of a non-materialist sort sort of want to pick with the neurosciences is not our fight. We don't have a dog in that race. And that's sort of the case I've come to make to you tonight. Okay. Um, so you know, the, the, the title of the lecture is Compatibility of Neuroscience and the Soul. And just by virtue of the title, it would seem that we're expecting there to be a problem, right? That I, I have to come and show you the compatibility. So we wouldn't expect there to be a compatibility between neuroscience and a, say, traditional conception of the soul, all right? Um, let's talk about that first. Uh, why, would, why would we expect there to be an incompatibility between uh, accepting the existence of the soul and, say, accepting the results of neuroscience? I think if we were to query the, you know, the person on the street, uh, maybe not all of you because you've, you've had, you know, Thomas types coming to you for, you know, four or five times now, maybe, you know, better than this, but I think if we were to ask the person on the street, you know, what is the soul, the sort of answer we would get would be something like it's what does my thinking or my feeling, right, or what makes my decisions. Um, you might get something like Rene Descartes' famous thinking substance, where he means the seat of consciousness. And I think the idea behind this is, on the one hand, there's this physical substance, that's your body, and maybe most relevantly for our discussion, your nervous system or your brain. And there's this non-physical substance. And there's certain types of attributes that you have. Some of them are physical attributes, your height, your weight, right? the neurochemical events going on in your, in your nervous system, right? And on the other hand, you have these other types of attributes, your non-physical ones, your feelings, right? Your thoughts, your emotions, your acts of will, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the physical attributes are had by this physical substance or this collection of physical substances. And the non-physical attributes, well, they have to be had by something, and they can't be had by the physical thing, so they're had by this non-physical thing, Okay. And I think when most people think about a soul, uh, what they're thinking about is this non-physical substance. Uh, it's sort of, you know, we, you know we, when we're kids, we, we, we picture it as sort of a ghost that looks like you, but you can see through it, right? Okay. Uh, but the idea is, is on the one hand, you've got your nervous system, and it's doing something, and then you've got your soul, and it's doing something else. All right? And maybe they interact, and, th and that's sort of the idea, is that events or attributes occurring in your soul have an effect on attributes occurring in your nervous system, and then events in your nervous system have occur and they have effects on what's going on in your soul, okay? But the idea here is, in the same way that, you know, my body is a distinct thing from pushing and pulling on the podium, your soul, in some other way, is a distinct thing pushing and pulling on your nervous system, somehow interacting with you. Okay, um, and I think that is when we say soul, sort of typically what we what we mean. And you know, my, my reason for thinking that is it's so very hard to get my students to quit thinking that about soul. Okay, <laughs> they'll they'll claim not to be substance dualists, but uh, they they always seem to fall back into it. Okay, now I'm not here to refute substance dualist. I'm, act dualism. I, I'm actually not even really here to prove anything. I just want to show compatibility. I want to show you a way of thinking about the soul that's different from that. Um, I think substance dualism, the idea that you have a, a mental non-physical substance and a physical substance that are distinct and somehow composing you, I think it raises problems. I think some of those problems are enough to make us deeply question the theory, but I don't think I can demonstrate that uh, substance dualism is false. And in fact, my book, I go a long way to defending it. I don't hold the view, but if I had to, I think I could. Okay, I'm glad I don't have to. All right. But some of my best friends are substance dualists. Okay. All right. uh, I'm sort of recovering substance dualists. Now, um, the important thing I want to emphasize about that picture of the soul as a substance is that 
We think of the soul as causing effects that we could, say, detect in the world somehow. Okay. All right, now, why would that run into trouble for neuroscience? And this, this is the part of the lecture I was most worried about because I'm at MIT and I'm talking about neuroscience. Okay, but I think part, at least, of what neuroscientists do is they discover physical causes of conscious phenomena. Right? Or at least they, they, they make discoveries that show us which components or modules or parts of our nervous system are responsible causally for certain aspects of our consciousness. Right? You, know, we, you, know, you go to even your introductory psychology class and you'll be shown the parts of your brain that are associated with color perception, the parts of your brain that are associated with the emotions, the parts of your brain that are associated with olfactory perception, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay? And of course... You know, the specificity of all that is, is maybe ambiguous at this point, but further and further and further through the use of studying pathologies by directly stimulating uh, human nervous systems, by technologies like MRI, neuroscientists are figuring out which parts of the brain are responsible for which aspects of consciousness. And that's not all they do. That's, a, I think, a big part of what they do. Okay? Now... In neuroscience is incomplete, obviously, right? There's lots of questions, but the tra trajectory of neuroscience is very good. It's discovering more and more and more and more, and it's getting more and more of a complete picture of how the brain causes our, well, I should say, how. It's getting a more and more complete picture of what the brain does to cause all the aspects of our consciousness. Okay, now, um, My concern about substance dualism in neuroscience is I think it's very unlikely that we are going to discover any phenomena uh, going on in the brain associated with consciousness that we need another substance to cause. Right? Uh, I think we're, we're getting increasingly a completed story here. There's no gap. We're not finding some event in the brain. Oh, we don't know what causes that. It must be that's what the soul's doing that. The soul's making that happen. Everything that occurs in the brain, we can associate, at least it looks like we'll be able to, associate with some prior event in the brain or outside the nervous system stimulating it physically. D does that make sense? Okay, so supposing neuroscience continues on that trajectory towards completeness. Well, there's no work left to be done by an immaterial soul then. If the soul is this thing that stands outside the brain and pushes and pulls on it, and we think it's there because there's something for it to do, right? some effect that we need to posit the soul to explain, I'm not expecting that once neuroscience becomes a complete mature discipline, there's going to be anything left for an immaterial substance like that to do. Everything that occurs in us consciously, it seems we are going to discover, or we have discovered, a prior physical antecedent to that event. And there's no events going on in the nervous system that don't have a prior physical antecedent that we would need a soul to explain. So there's this question, you know, what, what is, if there were an immaterial substance uh, that were this, this thing we call a soul, well, what's it doing? It would seem that it, 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 it's over-determined. All the effects that we describe to it, we already have physical explanations of that. And, you know... Uh, I don't have to tell you that we don't go around positing unseen causes for effects, right, when we already have explanations of those effects. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. So the worry is, what, what's the soul to do if that's what we think of it as? Okay. Now, I'm not saying there aren't remaining problems in the philosophy of mind. Okay. Uh, some of you may have heard of what's called the hard problem of consciousness. It's a, a term... It's thrown around quite a bit. And, and basically, uh, to use an example, an old example that Thomas Nagel used, it's, it's maybe crude, but I like it. Uh, he says, look, when you, when you eat chocolate and you taste, you, know, the, you have this qualitative uh, experience of, of the taste of chocolate, if somebody were to lick your brain, nothing would taste like chocolate. Okay. Uh, now, I don't know if Nagel's done the experiment, but I, be, I would bet. Okay. All right. And what's, what's Nagel's point is Nagel's point is that there's this qualitative aspect to our experience, okay, that there's nothing at the level of our neurology that would tell us 
what that's like, what it's like to taste chocolate, or why is it that the taste of chocolate is associated with a certain set of neurons? There's nothing about those neurons that's chocolate-like. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And so there, there's no, and you think of it, what neuroscience does, it's not going to explain that problem. Neuroscience can show us what parts of the brain are responsible for, say, the, the taste of chocolate, right? Or, you know, what it's like to see the color red, whatever example you like. But you're never going to find out why is it? Why is it that those neurons are the chocolate-tasting neurons? Okay. Um, and so, yeah, I think, there's, I think there's mysteries about consciousness. But the fact is, we know certain parts of the brain, in fact, cause us to taste chocolate. Right? We, we, can, we can do the science that shows that. Do we know exactly why they do that? No. But I think this is true of any scientific law. At some point, uh, that's just the way it is, and there's no deeper explanation. Um, if ultimately we start asking, you know, why, why do objects that have mass attract each other? We're going to say something like, well, the, the force of gravity. But why does it do that? It just does, right? We've discovered the, base, the most basic, broadest law. Do you see that? And there's no mystery there. It's just where, as Wittgenstein puts it, the spade is turned. We're out of explanations at that point. We just have a law there. And I think we will, if we don't, we will have laws talking about what the qualitative phenomena are and how we associate them with what goes on in our brain. Okay. So if, if my reason for thinking that there's a soul had anything to do with the need for there to be an immaterial substance, I don't think I would have good reason to think there's such a thing. I think neuroscience would provide a better explanation. Okay. Now, the good, the good news is, uh, is, you know, when we talk about the traditional notion of soul, uh, you know, and by that I associate it with uh, Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. That's the, that's the view that I want to represent to you here today. Their reasons for thinking there's a soul have nothing to do with consciousness. They have nothing to do with consciousness. Uh, the, the soul for them is a much broader principle than just consciousness. In fact, they think all sorts of non-conscious things have souls. Okay. Um, to make this point, I want to go way far afield here on you. Okay, we'll see if I can bring it back. I want to talk about first the notion of a category mistake. I'm going to use an example, famous Fawcett example from a guy named Gilbert Ryle, um, with whom I don't agree about much, but the example really works. So, let's say Corey shows me around MIT tonight. And he shows me you know, all the laboratories, and he shows me the students, the professors, the libraries, playing fields, all these things. And we get to the end of it, and I say, well, Corey, that's great, but you never showed me MIT. Where's MIT? He said, well, Jim, I showed it to you. you know, I showed you the buildings and the students and, and this, and we, we talked about weighty things and all this. That's MIT. I said, but you never showed it to me. Okay, clearly, you know, Corey's happy to get me back on the plane and back to Kansas, because I'm really confused here, okay? Because if that's the kind of question I ask Corey, I'm thinking of MIT as just one building among these buildings. But MIT isn't just one building among these buildings. Right? And it's nothing I could point to you. I mean, we could actually have MIT without any of these buildings. Right? We could, you know, something, the, the board of trustees could decide to move uh, MIT to Kansas, right? They could do that. They're not going to. <laughs> okay, right? But they could do that, all right? We can't, we, there's, and, we, and if you ask me, well, show me the effects that MIT causes. I couldn't show you a distinct set of effects that MIT causes, distinct from what I can show you with the buildings and the people and the students and the professors and the lab equipment and all that. Do you see my point? Is MIT a real thing? Yes, it is. Of course it is. Right? You've all labored hard to get here. right? Okay, it's real. But it's not the same kind of thing as, say, a building or a professor or a library or a laboratory or something like that. It's of a different logical category. Okay. And treating it as if it were one of these other things is going to lead to interesting gaffes of reason. Like me asking Corey, well, show it to me. Okay. I think a lot of talk about soul makes a very similar mistake as that. Okay. A lot of talk about souls makes a very similar mistake as that. Okay. Um, and I want to bring up an analogous problem that I think will demonstrate what I'm trying to say about the relationship between soul and your bodily life, okay? Um, 
if you were to look at Aristotle's preferred way to argue for God's existence. Okay, I'm not going to go deep into defending this here. We can maybe do that in the uh, question and answer period. But I just want to show you the method. Okay. And, if you, it, and this is also what appears more or less as St. Thomas Aquinas' first way in the famous five ways. Okay. So this argument is very concerned that everything we experience changes. It's always changing. Aristotle's term is motion. But when we say motion, we mean something rather different. Aristotle means, he mean, Aristotle means by motion, change, subject to change. And, and Aristotle would point out, look, everything in the universe right now is changing. And Aristotle will think, thinks, well, gosh, if it's all changing, whatever is causing it to change, if that thing itself is changing, then we don't really have an explanation there. So Aristotle comes to the conclusion that there must be something that is ultimately responsible for all the change going on in the universe, but itself is not subject to any kind of change. Right? This is his famous unmoved mover, as I like to call it, the unchanged changer. Okay? It's awkward, but I think it's, more, it's clear to us. Okay. Now, the important thing to note about that, and Aristotle has about as gapless conception of the universe that you can have. Okay? He thinks everything has an absolutely determining cause. Right? He thinks everything can be ultimately caused by the essence of things. So Aristotle isn't worried about whether or not we know what the cause of this or that case of motion is. He thinks he's got a perfectly good natural science to know that. He's asking a different kind of question. So why is there any motion at all in the universe? Okay. And so and he says, the only way I can explain that is if I go to something that is not itself in motion. All right. So, but if you, and he calls it the unmoved mover. But if you went to Aristotle and you said, look, Aristotle, Show me the effects of the unmoved mover. Show me the effects of the unchanged changer. Show me the gap that it operates in in nature. Show me what you can't explain naturally in terms of the actual things moving around that you need this un unchanged changer to explain, that unmoved mover to explain. Aristotle would say, you've missed the point. He doesn't think there's a gap. He doesn't think there's some effect that we don't know the cause of through our natural sciences. He's asking a different kind of question. He's asking, why is the universe in motion at all? Not what causes this or that instance of motion. Do you see my point? Okay. And often you'll see this in, in debates about God's existence. And people will rightly ask, well, if God exists, then what's he doing? Show me his effects. Show me this thing he's doing in nature. And the Aristotelian of the Thomas sits back and says, that's quaint. You've kind of missed what we're saying here. That's like asking, where's MIT? It's not that kind of thing. It's not the kind of thing I can show you. Now, I'm not saying the relationship of MIT to, this, to the buildings here is the same as the relationship as the creator to creation, of unmoved movers to, to the moving universe. All right? But the, the analogy is just that it's the same kind of mistake. All right? It's to treat things of very different logical types as if they were the same type. And then that leads to all sorts of strange questions and, and things and insoluble puzzles. Okay. Now, back to the soul. Now that I've dug a deeper hole in the shape. Okay. So what do Aristotelians and Thomists mean by the soul? <clears throat> As I said before, it has nothing to do with consciousness, at least not in the general case. Let's take the example of just this podium here. Uh, I think this podium is a real thing. If we were going to count the objects in this room, the individuals in the room, I think we would all count this podium. Okay. There are, well, I can find philosophers who would deny that there are such things as podiums, but, you know, <laughs> I could find philosophers who deny that I'm standing here talking to you too, so you have to give me that much, right? Okay. Um, and why do I think this podium is a real thing? Well, I think for two reasons, okay? It has what I'll call synchronic unity, and it has what I'll call diachronic unity. And by synchronic unity, I mean right now, this thing is somehow distinct from all the parts that compose it. We could take the, a sledgehammer to this desk and smash it up and have all the parts here, but it wouldn't be a podium anymore. We would have lost the podium. Do you see that? So there's a kind of unity that the podium has that is not part and parcel of its parts. Because we could have the parts and not have that unity. Okay. Now, if you deny that, you're going to say there aren't podiums, and I agree with you, there are people who say that, and maybe we'll argue about that later. All right? <laughs> but uh, my case for that would be that we could smash it, have the parts, and we would clearly lose something. 
So you mean by synchronic unity? All, right now, at this moment, there's a thing here. It's the desk, and it's not just the parts, because we could have the parts here and not have the desk. Okay. I'm part of the podium. I wrote desk here, and it's throwing me off. Okay. Uh, it also has diachronic unity, dia over time. You know, we could take out, you know, one screw from the podium, and we wouldn't all say, lo, a new podium, right? It's just, it survived the change. And we could put another screw in there, and we wouldn't say, oh, a new podium. We'd say, no, it, the, the same, one in the same podium survived the change. Okay? So not only is this thing in some sense distinct from its parts and has a unity its parts lack, but it can also survive changes of its parts over time. Okay? All right, so the point here is that the, the podium or any physical individual, right, is a composite object now in the Aristotelian view, okay, in, the, in St. Thomas Solstice. And this is the famous distinction between matter and form, which many of you may have heard of, okay. So there's, there's, a, there's a set of composing parts that this podium has, and in of themselves, those parts are potentially a podium. They could have been something else, right? We could have made a little, little Trojan horse out of them or a chair or what have you, okay? So they, they had the potential to be a podium. They also have the potential to be a lot of things, okay? But then in addition to that, there must be something else. There must be something else present here that distinguishes these potential podium parts, right, uh, or as actual podium parts as opposed to the other things they could have composed. And whatever that is, whatever it is that has to be present here, to make this a podium rather than something else, that's what Aristotelians call a form. Okay? And I have to be careful because like, there's, there's a tendency to over-romanticize the Aristotelian notion of form. In this case, it's something really boring. It's just simply a configuration. Right? So what, what has to be done to this, if we broke this thing apart and we put it back together, what do we do to it and put it back together? We just configured it. Okay? But without the configuration, this wouldn't be a podium. Now, so for that reason, the Rishon says it's composite. It's the matter, right, the parts, and a form, something done to the parts to make it actually that kind of thing. Okay. In this case, the Aristotelian calls the form an accidental form. This is going to be important for later. It's an accidental form. Not in the sense it's mistaken. I'm sure this was no mistake. Someone intentionally did this. Okay. It's accidental in that when the podium was constructed, okay, really what we did is we didn't make something entirely new. What we did is we rearranged, let's just say it's only wood. To simplify. We rearranged wood, okay? And this podium isn't going to undergo any changes under its own power that aren't just really the natural changes of wood, okay? All it's doing is really very slowly decomposing. It doesn't grow, it doesn't pursue podium mates, right? Uh, right? It doesn't, it's not thinking about things, it's not developing to the, the podium end, it's just wood that's been arranged. Okay? So the way the Rishonim would say is this is actually, the podium is really an accidental entity. It's an accident of wood. It's not the same thing as the wood because, once again, the wood could have been lots of other stuff. In this case, it's a podium. All right, now. Let's take another example. Let's take a cat. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I don't know why, philosophers working in this area always pick cats as their example here. Um, so I'm just following suit. Is our cat uh, composed of physical parts? Most certainly. Right, you can pick or, pick them up. Okay, is the cat identical to its physical parts, or does it have synchronic and diachronic unities that its parts lack? Well, it certainly has. You know, this is an unfortunate example, but if <laughs> if if the cat were to have an unfortunate accident with, say, a wood chipper, right? Okay, you would have all what on the far side. You could collect all the what parts. But it wouldn't be what? It would not be a cat anymore. Okay, I have nothing against your cat. Okay. <laughs> the freshmen at Benedictine College are constantly frightened by the example. Okay. Right. Now, yeah, it wouldn't be a cat. 
Do you see the, the unity the cat has that that pile of, say, three pounds of former cat at the far side of the wood chipper doesn't have? Okay, so the cat is, strictly speaking, not identical to the parts. So think of it. If we get down to the right molecular level, we could make those parts into what? Just about anything. I mean, some of you, you know, maybe even work on these sorts of things, right? We could make that into, you know, a, all sorts of other things. So do the, do the physical parts of the cat have potential to be something else? They do, okay? So right now, the fact that we identify that cat as a distinct individual of a certain kind, right, requires another component besides its parts, its physical parts. We call that the form of the cat, okay? Likewise, right, kitty will, you know, eat some tuna, right, shed hair, do the whole digestive process, so, so the cat is constantly what? Gaining and losing parts. But yet the cat remains the same cat. Now, once again, we can find philosophers who are happy to deny that there are cats. There's no such thing as cats, there's just cat parts. Okay. And I'm not here to scoff at the view. These are bright people. But, once again... Uh, I'm going to operate under this sort of common sense assumption that there are indeed cats, okay? And they're distinct from their parts this way. So our cat has a special kind of synchronic identity and a special kind of diachronic identity, just like the desk, okay? So by the Aristotelian reasoning, the cat is not just its matter, it's its matter and its form, okay? Now, when an Aristotelian talks about a soul... All that's meant there is the form of a living thing. So Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, almost anyone in the scholastic tradition would say the cat has a soul. And they would say the trees outside right now, they have souls too. Right? I mean, how do you, here's their case. Well, this was a tree once, right? Or the, the parts of this were a tree. Well, what's missing? The soul of a tree. Now, does that mean there's a mind in there? Is that what Aristotle's saying? No, definitely not. Is there a conscious thing here? No. All he means by the, the tree having a soul or a plant having a soul is just that there is something that distinguishes it in terms of synchronic and diachronic identity from its physical parts. Okay. In a living thing, they call it a soul. Which, you know, in Greek is just their word for the animating principle, the thing that makes it alive. Okay. Now, in the case of the cat, the soul isn't an accidental form, though. Because I mean, we, you know, we, we laughed earlier when I said, look, the, the desk you know, doesn't uh, pursue its own good. Right? It's not out there trying to eat. It's not trying to go out there and procreate and more death, make more desk kind. Right? It's not, it doesn't shed. It doesn't do all this. It doesn't do anything on its own. Okay? It's just wood, and it doesn't do anything that wood doesn't do. Okay. The cat, however, is amazing. The cat does all sorts of things that the stuff on the far side of the wood chipper can't do. It does pursue its own good. It does go out and try to make more cat kind. Right? It is conscious. It has all these capacities that are not just capacities of its parts. They, they may be caused by its parts, but they're not, strictly speaking, the capacities of any one of its parts. In that case, then, the Aristotelian says... We don't just have an accidental being here. We have a new substance, a new substantial being when the cat comes to be. Okay? So they say that the form of the cat is a substantial form. And if it's a living thing that has a substantial form, they call it a soul. All right? So this, this is my, my first takeaway. You know, is the soul is, is more, it's a, kind of a boring thing compared to what we typically think of it as, as this ghostly spiritual entity that has my thoughts and feelings. That's not Aristotle's view. That's not St. Thomas's view. The soul is simply that by which you're a living thing of a certain kind, that you have synchronic and diachronic identity. Okay? And your possession of a soul in that sense is nothing special in nature. All living things in that sense have souls. And in fact... Your soul is something that we understand by analogy with, with the forms of non-living things, too. Okay. Now, if you... Uh, if you 
So one thing I want to note as an aside, I think it's very important. Um, for the Aristotelian, then, okay, when a living cat body came to be, the cat came to be. Do you see my point? And as long as there's a living cat body, the cat still is. Because is the cat its matter? No, right? Because it's exchanging matter all the time, okay? Is the cat its soul? <coughs> no, because it's the composite of what? The soul and the matter, right? The soul isn't the cat. It's what accounts for the cat being the kind of thing it is given its matter, Okay, so this is very important for a lot of the moral doctrines that Thomists and Catholics generally hold, right? Is that you aren't your soul, you in fact are your living body. Now your living body must be composed by matter and a soul. But you're not the soul. We'll talk about this in a bit maybe. Maybe your soul survives your death and maybe you can be resurrected someday. But it's not you that does that, right? <clears throat> right? You're a living body. You're a composite of these two things, right? The cat comes to be when you have these new capacities, right? This new trajectory of life. And as long as it's on that, it's still a cat. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now, hmm. so if you went to Aristotle, you went to Aquinas, and you said, okay, we've got our cat here. Or, you know, we've got Corey here. And, you know, we, we, we put him on MRI, put the cat in MRI, put the x-rays, okay, and we, see, and we look at all the things going on physically. We say, okay, well, show me what the soul's doing. Where's the soul's fr- footprint in there? Where's the gap in the biological system that the soul fills? Aristotle or St. Thomas would say, you missed the point. Category mistake. You, it, you, we just showed you the campus. You asked, where's MIT? You missed the point. You don't understand what we're talking about here. Right? The soul isn't that kind of thing. It's not something that has discrete effects that we can find the fingerprints of in our scientific studies. Am I saying it's not real? No. I'm saying it's very much real, but it answers a different kind of question. Okay? There's nothing that on an MRI right, or an X-ray or anything we can do empirically that's going to solve the issue one way or another whether or not our cat has synchronic and diachronic unity. It's a different kind of question. It's a metaphysical question. And this is, a, this is the answer to that kind of question. Does that make sense? So I think for these reasons, the Aristotelian is happy to welcome whatever the neurosciences tell us about what goes on in consciousness. Because right? we're not looking for a gap that the soul can fill. We're not trying to, trying to find something science can't explain. It's a different kind of question. And to, and to go looking for gaps in the scientific record is, once again, to make this sort of category mistake. Okay. All right, now. It's not all that easy, though. Okay. <laughs> um, if you were to read Aristotle's early books, he starts out with the categories of one of his logical books, and he says, well... There's got to be substances, there's individual substances on which everything else depends. And he gives examples like ox, you know, oxen, a human being, the trees, that sort of thing. Okay. And then later in his book, The Physics, he says, yeah, but these things change. Hmm. So it's more complicated than I thought. So they must, the substances must be composite. They must be matter and form, as we've discussed. Okay. And then he goes on to start looking, and he says, well, there's different kinds of forms now. You've got accidental forms. You have substantial forms. And wait, some of these substantial forms are the substantial forms of living things. So he writes a book on living things, De Anima, right, on the soul. And Aristotle likes a nice, tight picture, right? He, he, he wants a gapless nature, like any good scientist, okay? And the issue comes up, well, can a form survive the destruction of the body that it's the form of? Okay, and think of it, if I smash up the desk, we come here with the sledgehammer, smash up the desk, or we put the, the desk, through, the podium through a wood chipper. Okay, matter is still around, but what happens to the form of the podium? It's gone, 
Now, maybe as an abstract universal, but the individual is still, it's gone. There's no form left, okay? Likewise, sadly, if our cat has the unfortunate accident we mentioned earlier, okay, it would seem what? We've got the matter, but the form is what? It's gone, okay? So Aristotle says something very interesting about this. He says, Typically, there, this is my saying here, there aren't forms without matter. Aristotle says something conditional about this. Some parts of a soul may be separable because they are not actualities of any body at all. Okay. So what Aristotle is saying is if you found a substance that had powers that couldn't be powers that were directly caused by matter, then he thinks it's possible that that form might actually survive on its own. Because then it's not just a configuration of the matter. It's got to be more like an individual that does something. Okay. And so, you know, Aristotle uh, goes through all the different levels of soul, right? And he gets to the human case. And he says, ooh, it's less tidy here. <laughs> okay. Because he thinks there's very good reasons to think that human beings have a capacity, right, that isn't the capacity of just straightforwardly physical things, of, of, of a material thing, okay? I want to talk about that. The kind of argument I'm going to make about this is not really what Aristotle does, okay? It's, a, it's an argument commonly made by later Thomists. I think the best version of it in print is by a recently late uh, philosopher, James Ross, who I think is one of the, the most underappreciated Catholic philosophers in the last generation. Edward Fieser has also done, recently published on this. And you can find some of this in Mind, Matter, Nature, too. But read those other guys first because their papers are better. All right. Okay. Um, let me give you an example. See? We just think of the law modus ponens. Basic logical law. Okay. Now. This law, right, is indifferent to the way we embody it physically. Right? Some of you may have seen this in other notations, right? I mean, sometimes you can use, you know, low case with an arrow instead of a horseshoe. Or we could use Greek letters, or we could use any letters we want. We could come up with any system we want to represent that law. It's utterly indifferent to the physical expression of it. You see that, okay? And even if we were to think of it as a configuration of neurons, okay, the law could be expressed by other configurations of neurons, all right? And the point here is that any physical representation of that law is subject to interpretation, It depends on whether we interpret those symbols to actually signify the law or not. There's nothing intrinsic about the symbols for the expression of the law. Do you see my, see my point? Okay. And moreover, the law applies universally. So the law is absolutely definite. It's absolutely determined. There's no ambiguity in modus ponens. Okay. There's no interpretation to modus ponens. But any, any expression of it, whether it be in chalk on a board, in ink on a page, or even in a configuration of neurons that we're, we're, that's occurring in us when we do this, is always subject to interpretation. Another configuration of neurons could do that. Another configuration of chalk on the board could do that. It's always indefinite in its physical expression, but the law is itself very much what? Definite. Okay. Do you see the point? And in fact, no physical thing will be definite in the way that a law of logic is, okay? Moreover, right, something like a law of logic applies all times, all places, universally, okay? But all the, all the effects of a physical event are always finite. They always are limited. They always occur at a single place in time and space. Whereas the law of logic does not occur in a single place in time and place, it's time and space, it occurs Universally, absolutely. Okay. And for this reason, then, 
uh, a lot of Aristotelian, later Aristotelian Thomas will say that our ability to graph something like a law of logic, okay, not just mimic it. I mean, I can get my five-year-old son to mimic the law. Cormac, P or shoe Q, P, say Q. Right? If I tell him there'll be candy involved, I can train him to do that. Okay? <laughs> but I don't think he actually grasps the law. Right? The actual grasp of the law right, is something definite and universal, and there's nothing in nature that is definite in that sense, right? and universal in that sense. Okay? For that reason, all right, uh, a lot of us think, yeah, there is something in the human capacity to reason, in as much as we can reason deductively and absolutely, that is not just straightforwardly a physical effect. Okay? Now, I want to be careful there, because I don't doubt, you know, if, if uh, we could, you know, have Corey on an MRI while he's in his logic class, we would see physical events going on. Okay, so I'm not saying Corey can do this without events in his brain. What I am saying is, I don't think there's anything in Corey's brain that explains the universal definiteness of his grasp of modus ponens. Even if there has to be this causal antecedent in him physically for it to occur. Okay, does that make sense? So I might say, uh, the, the neurological antecedents to say logical reasoning are predictively sufficient. Okay, if you tell me the events going on in Corey's brain, I think someone might be able to say, yeah, I know what he's thinking, but well, not yet, but someday that might happen. Okay, but I don't think that actually explains these aspects of it, right? The universality of it and the definiteness, the, the determinacy of it. Okay, now, um, so note though, I'm not, that's why I'm saying, I want to be careful, I'm not making a sort of soul a gap here argument, okay? Uh, I'm not saying we're, we're going to discover something that, some event in the brain that is unexplained physically. What I'm saying, though, is there's an aspect to our consciousness there that is not explained physically, nor can it be explained physically. Okay. And for that reason, I don't think that poses any kind of threat to the neurosciences at all. I think a neuroscientist could, could tell me many informative things about what's going on in my brain when I'm thinking modus ponens. But once again, there's this different kind of question I'm asking. You know, where comes the, the determinacy and the universality of that law of logic that, that we're grasping when we do it. Does that make sense? And if that's the case, then yeah, it does seem that there's something our soul does that is not just an effect of our bodies. Okay. And if that's the case, then it doesn't seem unreasonable to think that such a thing could survive with, with the destruction of the body. Okay. But I would maintain the thing that survives would not be me, and it would not be me until, once again, there'd be a resurrection. So that is my conciliatory uh, claim about neurosciences and the traditional conception of the soul. All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we have a few minutes for questions, so feel free. Sir? Yeah, so like you said, uh, like universality and definiteness were the two properties of the soul that might survive. Or our thinking that would show that might, the soul might be doing something. Because they're kind of these universals, they're not really a physical thing. Um, right. But what about just the ability of somebody to know things, to will things, you know, these... Yeah. That's not, that seems outside of the domain of neuroscience also. If, um, when, when you say know things, okay, what, what, what I hear there is, yeah, that you're able to have an understanding of things that allows you to reason deductively about it. So I would say, yeah, I agree. Uh, when, when you say knowing, I, what I take you means knowing things that are universal and necessary. Okay? Uh, the, way, the way I would define the, the important aspect of our consciousness is that we can grasp a concept that allows us to make deductive inferences based on that con concept. Right? It can play a role in something like modus ponens. So I agree, I think that is what is about us, right, that neuroscience cannot explain. But I want to be careful, I do think that neuroscience can tell you very much that there is a physical antecedent to that going on, right, but I don't think neuroscience explains the universality of knowing at all, okay. 
willing, uh, there too, I think, whenever you will, if it's a real act of will about which you're responsible, it's based on your grasp of something as a good, right, as a means to an end or something like that. And there too, I think, you're, you're, you're doing something that you could put into a deductive argument. So I, I agree with you. But, but I would unknown. I suspect that the neuroscientists in the room would say, yeah, we know that there's, there's physical causal antecedents there, and I agree. Right. But I don't think they explain fully the universal and definiteness of those acts. Does, does that make sense? Sir? Um, thank you for the talk. Um, one Welcome. thing I don't fully understand is the, um, what do you mean by the neuroscientists cannot explain the universality of this globe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say I put a, a baby in the scanner mm -hmm. and a, an adult in the scanner. Yeah. So the adult has an understanding of the universality of this. Mm -hmm. And the baby doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if I can separate, um, based on the brain activity, I can distinguish that you know, this one has a un understanding of that universality, yeah. and this baby doesn't. Is that, does that like refute what you were saying, or? Yeah. I, I don't think it does. Okay, so, <laughs> I, I just want to understand yeah, no. what do you mean by yeah. um, brain cannot ex you know, explain I, the universality. Let's say, uh, simply because, I mean, in, in, it, I know I'm being really crude by saying, we'll put you on an MRI and see what's going on here. Right, okay, no, it's not that simple. But let's say we, we did put an adult on an MRI. And this is someone that we're pretty sure isn't just mimicking modus ponens. They've really got it. Okay. They're, they've gone past midterm in the freshman logic class. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I don't think there's anything on that MRI that will tell us whether what they are grasping is a universal or it's merely a particular. Do you see there's this, there's this question about it that the MRI will never answer. And it's not, it's not a limitation of the science. The science just isn't concerned with this. Do you see that? Now, and I think, though, in, in a sense, though, when we look at the baby, the part of the brain, and I'm, 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 if I'm doing violence to the science here, let me know. The part of the brain necessary to pull it off is just not up and running yet. So we might be able to know, you know, the baby is not doing it because the, neuro, the neurological antecedents are just not there. Okay, but now we've got two people. You know, you're, you're, you're freshman getting an A in logic, you're freshman getting a D in logic, okay? I don't think the neurosciences are going to, you know, they might be one for one, well, maybe they're both getting A's, but one's mimicking and one's really getting it. I don't think the neurosciences will solve that issue. So I, I wouldn't doubt that the brain is the same, if that makes sense. I'm sorry, why do you not think that? Um, this, okay, uh, let me, may I vary the example? Sure. Uh, I, I used the example in the paper, and no one liked it, so it might not work. Let, let's say you have two possible worlds. One where realism is true, where there really are universals. Okay. And one where nominalism is true, and there aren't universals. Everyone's just mimicking. Okay. It's a thought experiment. I don't think anything we could look at in our brains would tell us which possible world we're in. Whether we're in a realist one or a nominalist one. Because I, I think either, whether, whether when, I, when I think about a general idea, whether it's an absolute definite universal or it's merely an accidental collection of things, I don't think anything empirically is going to solve that issue. The, sir, please. Okay, yeah, sorry. I, the, the answer you gave was different than the, what I understood earlier. So sure. I, I agree with that aspect of it. The, yeah. the thing that I heard you saying earlier was that, um, okay, let me put it a little differently. Suppose that I believe that, that the world actually has realism, and we define realism. Sure, sure. Um, it may well be that we can tell um, with people that the scans will show whether they have a realist understanding of it or they have a nominalist understanding of something. Right. So, well, we don't know. I mean, maybe yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. could well be that that's the case. Yeah. Whether, in fact, the world is a yeah. real, you know, whether or not realism is true or nominalism is true, Yeah. Uh, that I agree with you. The, yeah. the um, neuroscience will have no... Um, insight into. I just, right. I, but it may well be that I can tell between the students who really yeah. understand and the students who don't really understand, yeah. even if they exhibit the same behaviors and therefore both get the same scores and tests. But that's the right. criteria for things, um, you know. But I might possibly be able to tell. Yeah. It may not, it may not care. Um, if you can mimic something enough. I don't know why you necessarily care. But, right. but that's a different question from whether or not we can tell. The neuroscience might be able to tell versus the question of whether the world is in fact yeah. that way or not. Yeah. And that's why I went to the better example. 
Because I think that's the important question. Yeah, if I there think. are universals, then I think we get them. Okay. And then I think then there's something about us that's importantly non-physical. Okay. But I don't think there's any empirical test for whether there are universals. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Are you trying to say that neuroscience is analogous to reason and the soul is analogous to intuition? Or am I getting different? I would not want to I would not want to say that. Uh, well I guess what do you mean by intuition? Because this is mm. something which cannot be explained or logically so like yeah. to connect it to the other question. Let me let me make, make a distinction in answering. I I don't think whether they're universals is an intuition in the sense of uh, it's a question that we can only answer non-rationally or something like that. Okay. I think it might be an intuition in the sense that I cannot. It may be a first principle. Right? It's not something that I could prove to you by some deeper argument. Right. Uh, in, in in the same way, I don't think I have an intuition that th this is a podium, but I don't think I have a deeper argument for it than just my, the, the apparency of it to my mind. Th does that make sense? So I'd be willing to say to you the question about universals is an intuition in that sense. It's maybe a first principle, it's maybe something I have, it's where the spade turns, it's the most fundamental claim I can make, but I don't think it's an intuition in the sense that it's non-rational, it's, it's subjective or it's a matter of feeling or something. See, I'd, I'd want to. By explained, you mean is there some syllogism based on a more fundamental set of premises that I can use to arrive at the really reality universals? No, I don't think there is. Okay, but all reasoning has to come to stop somewhere in some basic set of first principles. What, whatever, whatever this is. And I don't think those first principles are necessarily non-rational or non-logical. They're just not arrived at by some further set of reasoning. I'm not arrived at by a proved scientific. I'll give you that. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah, I'll give you that. And so what you mean by the, by the scientific method? Yes, right? So some earlier inquiry, yes. I agree with you on that. But I want to be careful with calling it non-rational. Because I think it's perfectly rational for me to believe that the podium's there even though I don't think I can buy some scientific method. Something which has not followed an earlier path of scientific... Yes, yes. Scientific. I'm happy, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sir, you had your hand. Thank you for the talk. I have three questions. Three questions? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ultimately computational machines? Is the software and computer its soul? And could you expand on the difference between mortal and immortal soul? Sure. Okay, so the first question, I, I, don't, I don't think we are ultimately computational machines, okay? Um, I, I think, if you're, you may be familiar with some of these things, I, I think Searle's Chinese room objection to that model of the mind, controversial, but I don't think it, his objection has been really undermined. If you're not familiar with that, we can maybe go into that, okay? Uh, Things I'm less confident. I think I think some of the the girdle type proofs and things make me really question that that we can use, that we can really take seriously a computational theory of the of the mind. Okay, um, so I'm not a functionalist. I don't I don't think the mind is just software or something like that. Okay, uh, and and moreover, because once again, I think there is a distinction between say a computer doing modus ponens and us doing modus ponens. Okay. Though I will admit, uh, a, a computer will pass the Turing test. It, we might not be able to beat it in a logic, you know, contest or something like that. Uh, but for the re at the arg arguments I'm mentioning there, uh, I think they show that there's something intrinsically different between us and them. Okay. Your second question. Oh. We could think of the software running an iPhone. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I would I call it form, but I would call it soul because I, I don't think the iPhone's alive. In, in the same way, but remember, I mean, I think this has a form, right? Do you see that? But I wouldn't call it a soul because I don't think it's a living thing. Okay. Okay. Sure. So I, I think 
you know, the the tree that there's the ice was the tree that provided the wood for this desk had a mortal soul, a mortal, right? Uh, there was something that distinguished it as a living thing from the its composing parts. Call that the soul, right? And when the tree was destroyed, that was destroyed with it. Okay, but if you want to know what is what is the soul of a tree or something, I would I would ask a botanist what is it what is the what is the configuration of this that makes it a tree rather than something else, right? It's only in this one case with the human being, given our powers of rationality, I think there's some reason to think that that soul does something has an operation that's distinct from the body. Does that make sense? Sir. Sure. Uh, the soul is the fact that you have this substantial form versus the accidental form. Sure. Yeah. yeah. We have a real living substance here rather than accident or something else. Okay. Thank you, sir. Do you have another question? No. <laughs> um, so I guess what you described as accidental and substantial form sounds a lot to me like representations, right? So these are more like it's not that this belongs to the object or to the living thing so much as we construct it as, like, in mentally as having these things. Um, and, like, for example, uh, there are a few tests that have been done in, like, developmental psychology where they'll have a baby, they'll have it look at a shoe that's covered in felt, and it beeps and makes noises, and then they react to it as if it's alive. Right. Um, so, for that baby, you know, if you, if you were arguing that it seems to be alive, the baby thinks of it as alive, then yeah. maybe that thing has a soul from the baby's perspective. Um, at least that's what, that's what I'm kind of thinking sure. of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, is it more that the soul is less uh, the actual, I don't know, I, I would argue that maybe the objects themselves don't have these forms of any sort, but that we, we give these forms to things, and that that's what makes it have a soul or a form. Yeah. So then, would the soul be, I guess, in humans, are the <coughs> You know, um, in, the, in the case, you know, where uh, the, the child, you know, mis you know, makes this mistake mm -hmm. of saying, oh, you know, the, you know, my wind-up mouse is a real mouse, you know, and, 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 and he or she names it, and, and it's sad, and it gets rough, and okay. mm -hmm. That, I would say, it's, it's, it's a misattribution of soul. Mm -hmm. like what the child thought was alive, it wasn't real. Okay, so in that case, it was it was projected. But I would say that the mouse, the, the mouse, the wind-up mouse didn't have a soul. Okay, it was really just an accidental form, and the child was confused about that. So would but I don't think I'm projecting that in, to you, mm -hmm. and I don't think in a in a real case of a cat I'm projecting. Although I could be wrong, mm -hmm. I, I admit that. Yeah, okay, on that, the same in the case of the cat, yeah. I, I will ask a zoologist. Because, I mean, or like, say, these questions will come up of what substantial forms are they? You know, is a leopard a separate substantial form from a, a tiger, right? Mm -hmm. that, I don't think that's, and this is something that maybe not all the ones play the same, but that's not something I think of the philosopher to answer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to punt that question to. The, the right biological sciences to tell me when do we cross a threshold, if ever, between the leopard and the tiger such that you have fundamentally different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Because in that case, I'm more like the kid projecting my half-baked intuition, that, that's <laughs> my half-baked <laughs> intuitions onto those, that range of phenomena. Does that make sense? So, yeah, go ahead. This sort of follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience isn't so much just studying the brain as it is mm -hmm. trying to figure out like how things are done, how behaviors are created, mm -hmm. things like so a lot of it involves the computational aspects of it. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've gotten this question before, but if we were able to like perfectly replicate human consciousness in like a robot of some sort, like all the way down to thinking, to the way it reacts to things, and if it has feelings, which has not, would that then have a soul? I don't really would. Uh, in, in maybe, maybe I'm going to get stuck in the Chinese movement, but I think some of the arguments we see people like John Searle, uh, I think, show Whatever we're doing, we're thinking, it's not the same kind of thing that a digital computer is doing, even if the computer could perfectly mimic what we're doing. Mm -hmm. okay. So in that case, I think you could have a non-living thing that is very good at all these things that we're good at, but if it's non-living, I wouldn't call it having a soul. Okay. Now, when you, when you get animals, if you know tomorrow we discovered that 
uh, chimpanzees, in fact, can do geometry. We just haven't been talking about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> or dolphins, in fact, you know, can do modus ponens, and they just haven't been talking about it. Okay, if that were shown to me, I would say, it turns out that the expanse of the human kind in the important sense is broader than we thought it was, but we've been wrong about that before, right? Uh, you know, so in that case, I, I would draw, I wouldn't say that it turns out, that means we don't have mortal cells, that means it turns out other animals would too. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Machine though, because it's not alive, that's where I'd start putting it for now. Uh, if I may cut in, uh, yeah. we're running out of time for questions, so I think we'll have one more. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, I'm, he, seemed, he seemed really emphatic, so we're going to go with yours. Can, Sir. Can, I, can I ask about the stakes behind this? Um, stakes? Yeah. Okay. What, what are the stakes? Why, why are we talking about this? It, it, yeah. From the outside, it looks like um, you know, this is a threat to the Catholic Church or to the Christian, Christian conception yeah. of the soul. Yeah. Um, and, and, and your argument sort of gives away of that compatibility, and yeah. reconciliation, and so on. Can you explain, you know, what are the stakes? I assume the, the church is not a, a, a monolithic thing, but there are many factions inside, and how, yeah. how do these arguments fall within the stakes that, that, that are happening? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you could be a substance dual, dualist to be a Roman Catholic. I, I think you, now that's pr probably controversial, but I think you could be, okay? Um, <laughs> But everything's controversial, right? Okay, but I, I think you could be a substitute to be a Roman Catholic. Um, I think you've got, so my reasons for, say, rejecting substance dualism really don't have anything to do with my, my Catholicism, okay? Uh, I, I think you've got a lot of, you've got to tell a very ad hoc story about things like neuroscience now. And I think it makes things very heavy theoretically, uh, and, and I don't like that. And so if I have a way of not picking that fight and still uh, coming to what I think are, are the right conclusions about minds and such, I'll go that route, okay? Um, in terms of the church, you know, if you, if you were to open the Catholic catechism, it will say the soul is the form of a human body. I mean, it, it invokes the Aristotelian language, okay? So I think if we can make sense of it as close to home in the original Aristotelian language, I think that makes sense, right? I mentioned earlier, I think some of the moral doctrines of the church do hang on the idea of, of identifying ourselves as living bodies and not you know, souls trapped in bodies, okay? Um, but once again, I, I do think the dualists could, could pull it off in, in the church, okay? So for me, ultimately, the stakes are, I just think this is the best account of material objects first and foremost. I mean, I, I come to the, the Thomistic position first as, as an account of material objects that, hey, it has this great benefit. We're off the hook in philosophy of mind now, right? Um, and so for me, it, it really is a question of what's the best general account of the metaphysics of material objects, right? and then has this great application in the philosophy of mind, which is to basically dismiss the philosophy of mind. Okay. Hey, well, can we do one more? The, the young man is... Sure. Yeah. sure. Uh, what's your opinion? Like, I've heard so many times that uh, these doctrines of the world and all of that, at the moment of conception, that single soul that has the potency of becoming human being, yeah. but there's a soul there. Like, do you think there's a soul? Like, the soul is created or yeah. comes there or it's when it forms all the parts? Sure. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. Um, keep in mind what I think of the soul. What is the soul? The soul is that in virtue of which something is a substance of this kind. Okay? So when I, when I hear the soul is present at conception, what I'm hearing there is that thing is a human being, a human organism at conception. Do you see that? Okay. Uh, so what I always say it, it, to, to like scandalize my students is I could, like the angel Gabriel could come down tomorrow and say, Jim, turns out you're wrong, materialism's true, I'm sorry. Okay, you're, you're just wrong in this one. <laughs> Gotta take our word for it on this. Okay. It wouldn't change for me my view about something like abortion, okay? Because I would still think I've got reason to believe that that thing is a human, like a, a human animal at that point. And that's what I mean by having a soul, right? Is to be something that is of the human kind, it's developing as a human, it's not just matter, it, it's, it's, it's matter arranged in the particular human way at that point. Do, do you see that? So, 
Do, do I think uh, the soul is present at conception? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, what does that mean? That, that to me means it's a human being at conception, and human beings carry moral rights. D does that make sense? I, mean, I often tell my students that I think really good metaphysics takes really interesting things and makes them kind of boring. Right? <laughs> okay. That's a case where I think, I think good metaphysics takes an interesting and like really sexy problem and makes it kind of boring. Right. Right.